Hey gang, got a special episode for you here. I'm in Killarney, Ireland, doing the Imaginarium in Ireland. Just want to check out this gorgeous view here. I'm going to have a lot of pictures for you, and we're going to be discussing the effective place on the imagination. How does where we are affect our emotions? How does knowing the story behind a particular place affect us? In this video, I'm going to show you some of the pictures I took in Ireland and Scotland as I discuss the way taking a trip to another place can affect the imagination and how that in turn can affect the emotions. One of the most amazing things about Ireland is how there is a story to practically every hill grove, ring of stones, or castle ruins everywhere you go. Stories and imagination are soaked into the very soil of this place and Scotland is naturally the same way. I did visit Scotland this time around also but I was only there for four days which I learned is nowhere near enough time. I should have known better. Anyway I'll be correcting that next visit. If you are privileged to it, traveling to somewhere distant and exotic can be stirring and spark the imagination in many ways, no matter where it is. But I think there's a special and powerful effect when in place when it comes to its connection to one's own ancestors. Many of us Americans come from immigrant families originally, and of course there is the colonial legacy we have to contend with as part of our tumultuous history. Not only have we had wave after wave of immigrants enter this country, the transatlantic slave trade brought people not only from Africa but many places. That, of course, has been a contentious issue, to say the least, for the entirety of our existence as a nation. I don't propose to be able to solve that issue, but, nevertheless, reconnecting to the land in which one's ancestors dwelt for countless generations can be a pro profound experience. In America, the only ones who have this connection to the greatest degree are the Native Americans. And, of course, this is another area of history fraught with exploitation, violence, and oppression that we have in our turmoil-ridden history. Everywhere then there is history, some of it painful and toxic, some of it thankfully less so. In some cases you can find a place that connects to one deeply, and it may very well be due to the violence that happened there, or it could simply be due to the knowledge that many of one's ancestors lived in such a place for generation after generation. Like many, many Americans, I have quite a bit of Irish ancestors. In terms of diversity, I'm not very representative, <laughs> aside from one answer one ancestor from Nigeria, everyone else that made me originated from families in Ireland, Scotland, and England. Among the names are Cadigan, which is actually a Welsh name originally, Reagan, Woley, Driscoll, Murphy, Kahaney, Hurley. Goodwin itself is actually an old Anglo-Saxon name that can be traced to Scotland, Ireland, and England. So that fits. These are people whose line went back centuries and in some cases, thousands of years. But do I know that my ancestors were among them? Actually, yes. <laughs> Since I did a genetic ancestry testing, I know that I am almost entirely genetically derived from Ireland and the UK. So it's all concentrated there, at least for me. Presently, I live in Montana. Uh, and it is interesting that Montana is actually larger in terms of area than Ireland, Scotland, and England all put together. And I just got here. It is very beautiful. 
But I don't have the connection to it that I do in Ireland because of this link between land and the imagination and possible physical connection in the genome and the epigenome. Now you might think that there's really nothing real about any of this and that any feelings one might have about a given place is entirely due to their preconceived notions of it. It's difficult to disprove this assessment. But in my mind that's not really sufficient to conclude that that is the preferred interpretation in the absence of absence in the absence of evidence that states otherwise. It's just one theory among many. The feel of a place has many components coming from many places. And there are studies in evolutionary aesthetics that link our deep evolutionary past to what we tend to prefer in landscape paintings or photographs. We've talked about some of this here on the channel, of course, when we talked about how darkness is archetypally associated with the unknown, the unmanifest fear or unconscious forces. And this is not simply because some poet in the distant past conjured up this metaphor for whatever reason and it was passed down across the ages and spread far and wide. No. This connection between darkness and the unknown is due to our physiology. As diurnal creatures who evolved three-dimensional vision with high color acuity and relatively lower light sensitivity compared to other animals, our genome sets us up to be active during the day and relatively inactive at night. There's a whole host of instincts and predispositions organize us around how much light there is in an environment. If there is a lot of light, we are oriented towards exploration, hunting and gathering, activity, energy, seeking, play, and so on. Therefore, anyone, anywhere, is strongly predisposed to make this metaphor about darkness and light, which is what makes it an archetype. I think there are a whole host of these archetypal associations that are simply waiting in every human mind to be connected by the imagination. The imagination itself, of course, is always working, always connecting, always building meaning wherever it can. Because that's the job of the imagination, to build meaning. To ask the question, what is my life really about right now? It's not just about memory, although imagination is highly involved in memory creation, certainly. But the imagination is about much more. It's about meaning. It asks not only what happened, but more importantly, what does it mean? Hence, dreams arise, especially when we're asleep, and our brain doesn't have much else to worry about. Since the body is completely shut down, the brain can focus on meaning making, and this work that normally is going on in the background comes to the foreground. Interestingly enough, of course, our conscious awareness of all this activity is not always there. Only really powerful and emotionally charged content reaches our awareness. And by we, I mean the conscious ego, of course. In any case, place is a big part of this. Whole books have been written on the poetics of place, and movie makers are often very aware, at least on an intuitive level, of what a place can evoke emotionally, and they use that to serve their purposes of their stories they write and create. Just like darkness and light evoke certain emotional states, so too can artificial versus natural environments. Natural environments likely carry a whole host of powerful and evocative feelings that are barely capable of being put into words. Artificial environments can do this too, but this is because of the human stories that go into them. Castles, for example, evoke ancient people, conflicts, medieval life, our ancestors, the so-called primitive living, although medieval people actually ate very healthy food, assuming they weren't in the middle of a famine, of course. Castles invoke lords and peasants, those sorts of social delineations, but also wars, because so much of a castle is geared toward defense against armies, kings, queens, political machinations, and so on. As part of my most recent trip, I actually stayed in a castle that was, at one point, attacked by Oliver Cromwell and his forces. In, in both of these cases, that being natural and artificial, and the, in the natural and artificial environments, we are evoking the past. This is its, in itself can be very strong and pervasive force. Why? Because so many modern Americans, I think, are disconnected from their past. Because of all the coloni colonialism, immigration, civil wars, and so forth, many Americans have been uprooted from their deep past. And I don't mean here by a few generations. I'm talking about the past of a dozen or more generations. How many of us can look back to a place and say, this is where my foremothers and forefathers lived for thousands of years? Only the Native American peoples in this country. And in their case, their history has been brutally unkind to them. 
And so they are, in a sense, disconnected as well in a different way. For many, I think this is an insidious force, this disconnection. And I believe it's one which underlies a great deal of unrest, barely registered unease, a feeling of lack or not belonging, an unsettling feeling of being adrift in the universe, devoid of context, origin, and story. All of these mean loss of identity. This I see practically every day in my office, people suffering from this underlying loss of identity and meaning. So what's the answer? Well, I tell you this much. It isn't just analyst navel-gazing. The answer has to come in part from the workings of the imagination as it connects to what is outside of us. As I said before, the job of the imagination is meaning-making. It's also identity-making, connection and context-making. Those are all about meaning-making. It does this with symbols and metaphors because those things are the best suited to the job. So the process is one of image, of environment, and of feeling. To reconnect, to reroute, and to rebond, to remember that which has been disintegrated. Visiting another place rich in history, story, mythology, legend and symbol, and in the case of natural environments of innate beauty that appeals to our embodied selves. This is one way to do this, to reconnect, and to alleviate that feeling I was talking about earlier. When it comes to natural environments, in fact, there's a large body of evidence that shows that we as humans suffer, emotionally, mentally, and physically, when we are separated from natural environments too much. Some researchers even call this nature deficiency, and they say it's endemic to our current culture. As it seems, exposure to natural environments can improve immune function, mental health, chronic pain, a whole host of other issues. It's, it's as if we were set up genetically to live primarily in natural environments, and like fish out of water, don't do so well when we're chronically separated. <laughs> Who knew? In any case, Ireland and Scotland both have a great deal to offer in all of these ways. And I hope that these pictures convey more than what I might be able to communicate to you in words. It's impossible to look out on these landscapes with their ancient stone walls, built by humans literally thousands of years ago and maintained ever since, or the blackthorn groves, or the mist-covered mountains, the forested locks, the ruined castles and all that and not feel immersed in a massive context of past story, history, tradition, culture, and in my case, ancestors. But, in fact, I must correct myself. Actually, it is possible to walk, uh, walk amongst all this and not feel immersed, connected and invigorated, renewed and implanted and replenished. It is possible not to breathe it in, to slow down, to soak it into one's soul. It's possible not to allow the imagination to overwhelm you with tangible physical proof of your connection to so much that is beyond you. It's easy. Just simply stick your nose in your smartphone, put on your headphones, and remove yourself even further from your immediate environment. Shut off your imagination and consume. It's just that easy. Do I recommend doing that? Not in the least. <laughs> For the imagination to work on healing the disconnect you, the conscious self, must participate. You must open up yourself to it and let it in. Thanks for watching. Oh, 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 it's broad to mission. Gun, good gun,